All right, so today I want to introduce you to the pinto pied ball python. The pinto pied actually consists of two genes, the pied and the russo. As a matter of fact, it actually consists of three genes because you need two copies of the pied to get a visual since it's recessive. And it's kind of an interesting anomaly when you work russo in with a pied. Essentially what happens is you end up with a really high white pied, which is kind of an interesting effect. And if you look at some of the high white pieds when you're forcing them in with other genes like the spider pied, a lot times the spider pied is kind of limited because it'll push all the color and pattern just to the head of the snake and in the case of the russo it, it acts kind of similar but you're not kind of limited with just color on the head sometimes you can get color all over the body and I would say as far as kind of a low white pinto pied you know probably the worst that you could expect as far as going for a high white pied is kind of a 50 50 which is almost perfect in my opinion 50 percent white 50 percent color in a pied and it's kind of a interesting when you work other genes into the pinto pied, you can get some really high white pieds with really dramatic visual effects. So today I want to jump over to the internet and I want to show you the potential of the pinto pied ball python. All right, so I want to jump over here on morphmarket.com and I want to start with the Russo ball python. This is what a Russo looks like. As a matter of fact, the Russo is also known as the Hetlucistic. And it's, at first glance, it looks almost like a normal ball python, just like a wild type classic ball python. A lot of people may be confused and thinking that the Russo is actually a recessive gene because a lot of people call it Hetlucistic when in fact it's actually a co dominant mutation. And as a matter of fact, the Russo in a lot of combinations, sometimes you you can't even see that the Russo is in the mix. And kind of one of the limitations of this whole project is if you have the, the Pinto Pied contains one copy of the Russo, if you actually breed that to anything else in the blue-eyed leucistic complex, and there's quite a lot of them, there is, you know, like the Bamboo, the Lesser, the Mojave, the Phantom, the Special, the Mystic, the Mocha, all those are in the blue-eyed leucistic. And if you breed this Pinto Pied to anything that contains the, one of those genes, 25% of the time Time, you're going to end up with an all white snake with blue eyes, which is kind of an interesting anomaly if you're going for the pinto pied. A lot of times you can't tell, some of the pinto pieds are completely white, so you don't know if you actually hit the super, the blue eyed leucistic, or if you actually are just have a really high white, all white pinto pied, which is kind of one of the complications of the project. So if you actually take a russo and mix it in with a pied, this is what a pied looks like, and the pied is a recessive mutation. You need two copies of the pie gene to make a visual. As a matter of fact, this one is pretty much perfect as far as a pie. About, I, I like my pies about 50-50 with a lot of really high white about on 50% of the snake and you know the color on 50%. And they can be really variable. If you just take two pies and breed them together, sometimes you'll get a whole variety of high white pies and some low white pies. And you can really force the high white or the low white with certain genes. You can actually take Anchi and mix it into pieds and you'll always get a really low white pied and just on the flip side of it you can take russo mix it in and you get a really high white pied and take a look at this I, I pulled up a few examples of russo pies and this is probably the, the most color that you can expect on a russo pied all of them are even more white than this it's pretty amazing and kind of the cool thing about the russo pies is that you actually get kind of these black lines that outline the colors on the Russo Pied, also known as the Pinto Pied. And if you're looking at some prices on these, I'd say, you know, this one is actually, this one sold for 450, but I was actually looking over on Morph Market and it looks like they start about $650 for the ones that are actually for sale. So they're not really that popular and they usually sell for quite a bit of money. So I kind of wanted to show you some other versions of the Pinto Pied. So this one has quite a bit of color on it. And take a look at this one. I'd say this is probably your typical Pinto Pied. A lot of them have color on the head, but not all the time. And a lot of them just have little splotches of color here. And they're just kind of randomly distributed over the snake. It's kind of unexpected as far as where the, the color and the white is. Some of them just have color just on the head, kind of like a spider pied. And some of them, you know, 
know, spider pied, I'd say if you make spider into a pied, you almost always, I'd say all the time, you usually get color just on the head of the snake. And except for like the white weddings, the white wedding is the spider pied that is completely white with no color at all on the snake. And with the, the pinto pied, it can kind of really vary. You don't always get color. And take a look at this one. This is kind of what you'd never see in a spider pie. This is an all white snake with just a little bit of color right on the tail. And you can tell that kind of the outline of black around the color kind of gives it away in most cases. I'd say in some cases you actually don't have the black outline depending on what genes you're mixing in with the pinto pie. And here's one more I wanted to show you. Take a look at this. This is another pinto pie, completely white. So it can be really variable if you're working with the pinto pie. So I wanted to show you some other genes that we can mix in with the pinto pie to make some really amazing combinations. And the first one I want to show you is the pastel. This is a pastel, probably the most popular ball python gene in all of ball pythons. And essentially what the pastel does is it brings out a lot of yellow and usually reduces the pattern to a more or less degree. Sometimes you'll have, you know, a really high, almost like a, this one, I'd say it's pretty reduced almost into stripes in certain parts of the snakes. And sometimes you don't don't get much of a pattern reduction. Sometimes you still end up with some of the alien, kind of the Roswell gray alien heads on the side of the snake. And here's what happens if you work pastel into the pinto pie. Take a look at this beauty. That is an amazing snake. This is the pastel pinto pie. And some of these are kind of hard to hit because if you take a look at the genes and the genetics, it actually has two copies of the pied and then you have the pastel and the russo. So it's essentially a four gene combination. Combination. So it's a little bit more tricky to work other genes into the pinto pie. And if you look at the price on this one, this one actually sold for $900, kind of a high-end project. And take a look at this one. This is actually the pinto pied with two copies of the pastel. This is a super pastel pinto pie. A little bit harder to hit because now you're looking at five genes in the snake. But take a look at what the super pastel does. Essentially what it does is it really fades out the pattern a lot more. Gives it kind of this creamy effect on the whole snake. Kind of interesting. It almost gives it, almost you almost think it has like ghosts or something in there. Pretty amazing working two copies of pastel in to the mix. And this is pretty cool too. So if you actually work yellow belly into it, yellow belly is kind of an interesting morph because if you look at it just by itself, it looks kind of like a normal ball python. Sometimes the standalone morph is maybe a little more kind of a reddish orange compared to like a normal ball python coloring as far as just the normal wild type. And the yellow belly is, is <laughs> it really takes a trained eye to pick out the difference between a yellow belly and a normal, but there are differences, probably more differences than when you're trying to pick out a Russo from a normal. And one of the big keys on the yellow belly is usually on either side of the belly, it has a really busy pattern. And that is usually the key to identifying yellow belly. And sometimes it'll have like flames coming right up the sides. You can see just a couple little flames here, but usually you can tell by the belly. And here's what happens if you work yellow belly into the pinto pie. Take a look at this. And this one, <laughs> I can find a whole bunch of examples over here. This is a really high white yellow belly pinto pied which is kind of crazy and usually what happens when you work yellow belly in with a pied is it really takes the the color and it turns it like a bright orange which is kind of a really amazing effect of yellow belly on pieds and kind of the other interesting thing I've also noticed on a lot of your yellow belly pieds if you look at the pattern on the snake here usually the edges on the pattern are really kind of ragged when you add in yellow belly kind of one of the key indicators that you actually have yellow belly belly in your pied ball python. So here is a banana, one of my favorite morphs, just a standalone morph. It is really visually dominant. It almost looks like an albino, but this is co-dominant. So you breed it to something else, half the offspring come out as banana. And here's what happens if you work banana into the pinto pied and take a look at this. This is really an amazing combination. Essentially what you get is it changes all the, the, the colored spots on the snake to this really orange color, really amazing. And you get still get a real 
really high white pine and I'm sure this one is probably expensive this one is $1,500 sold just last year in 2019 let me tell you if you're into pines and you're thinking about trying to go for high white pines adding other jeans into the mix you may want to consider adding Russo into the mix so here is the albino, and I'd say when it comes to albino, probably the number one thing that everyone does with their albino is shoot for the albino pied, which is a double recessive. So this is quite a bit harder to hit because you know, you're know you actually working with a double recessive. And if you actually take an albino pied and you work in Russo, you actually get an albino Russo pied. And take a look at this. This is what you get. You get an albino pied that is really super high white, which is pretty awesome. As a matter of fact, a certain percentage of the time, if you're working albino into a, a pinto pied, you get an all-white snake with no pattern at all. That's the last one I pulled up here. And take a look at this. This is pretty amazing because it's an all-white snake with bright red eyes, which is, you know, in, in certain gene combinations, we actually call this a cherry bomb. And the cherry bomb is a blue-eyed leucistic, which is an all-white snake with the albino. You get an all-white snake with the white eye. I don't know if you actually call this one a cherry bomb. I'd say this is probably the high-end cherry bomb, the albino pinto pine. And if you actually take a look at the price on this one, this one sold for over a thousand dollars. And if you actually take a look at the jeans, you actually have two recessives, which is pretty tough to hit. And then you add Russo on top of the mix. Makes for a really amazing ball python. All right, so it is time for the question of the day. And Michael Westcott asks, how many females can one male ball python breed? And that is a very good question. As a matter of fact, when I first started out in ball pythons about five years ago, pretty much the rule of thumb that I always heard is that you can breed up to three females with one male. That's pretty much the safe number. And I pretty much went with that rule of thumb up until a couple of years later. And I was watching some old YouTube videos from like 10 years ago. And there was a guy breeding ball pythons. He had his breeding records up on a whiteboard on the side of his snake room. And I, I actually had to pause pause the video and <laughs> look at it. Just, I had to take a double take. He was actually breeding about 12 females with one male ball python. <laughs> it was pretty incredible. And you can actually do that. I've actually done that once with Bobby here. Bobby around my neck. I actually bred him to over 10 of the females. It was pretty crazy his first year. And um, believe it or not, like eight of those females laid eggs. It was pretty crazy. But if you actually have a, a male that's too young, or there's a lot of cases if you actually mix up a male and a female, and <laughs> you think you have a male and you actually have a female and you're breeding it with those females sometimes your entire season can be a bust if you're spreading your males too thin or if you mix it up and you're actually using a female instead of a male as a matter of fact when I actually bought I bought a whole collection of females from a guy and I thought they were all females and I was working Bobby through all the females and I put it in one tub and there was like some serious fighting in there like the whole rack was shaking and I found out that one of the females that I bought was actually a male it was pretty crazy you definitely want to know your males and your females going into your breeding season especially if you're breeding multiple females to any one male so that is pretty much it thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video